just music we are dealing with here. My name is Stephen Duke. I am the, currently the president of the Students for Sensible Drug Policy RSO here on campus. Um, uh, so uh, we're one of the one of the groups sponsoring this event. Uh, the other co-sponsors, University Programs, uh, really appreciate them helping us out, uh, co-sponsoring this event, getting Ethan and Asa to come and debate tonight. Um, yeah, give them a round of applause. Um, so I really appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, these, these two speakers are extremely qualified to debate on this issue. So especially if you don't even have a, maybe a, a opinion on this issue, you're going to learn a lot. Um, I'd also just like to thank a few SSD peers that really helped putting this event together. Uh, specifically Rob Founce, uh, Persia Richard, and Ryan Denham. Uh, they were an extreme help. Give them a round of applause. I, obviously, I'd also like to, to you know, thank uh, Asa and Ethan for both coming out. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a debate without them. So let's give them a round of applause. Okay. Uh, and also, I'd really like to thank our uh, moderator for tonight, uh, Mr. Jason Edgar. Uh, he's helping us out a lot. He has a lot of experience in debate and uh, being a moderator, so that's that's a real help for us so we can have a really professional and uh, you know a debate that's kind of everyone's kind of going by the time limit so it doesn't run over too long so let's give Jason a round of applause as well. So I won't stay up here too long but I just want to say if you guys like what you hear no matter what side of the issue you're on if you, if you enjoy this I would say please come to our next SSDP meeting. Uh, it's going to be next Thursday in Union 508, which is just right over there. Um, we'd really appreciate you to come. It's going to be at 5 o'clock on uh, next Thursday. So please come by, especially if you uh, support ending the war on drugs or at least looking at alternatives because currently it's, it's very clear that incarcerating uh, drug users uh, isn't fixing anything. Um, so without further ado... Uh, Well, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome our moderator and our two speakers up to the stage, and we can get this debate started. Um, just a uh, precursor as well, at the end of the, uh, the debate itself, there will be a QA. and a um, We'll let you guys know, and you'll be able to line up and uh, ask questions for Ethan and Asa. So uh, thank you again for coming, and let's welcome our uh, guests, our moderator and our two speakers today. University of Arkansas. All right. Ethan Adelman, we'll start with you. A uh, four-minute opening statement, not to exceed four minutes. Uh, Mr. Adelman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen Duke and SSDP for having me here, and thank you, Asa, for having this debate with me. So let me explain where I'm coming from on the drug issue. I start off with a very simple idea, which is that drugs are here to stay. That there's never been a drug-free society, except maybe the Eskimos because they couldn't grow anything, but basically there's never been a drug-free society, there's never going to be a drug-free society, and that's the reality that we have to accept. This notion about you know, zero tolerance, let's do anything, pay any price, bear any burden to make a drug-free society, I think it's time to abandon that idea, and I think more and more people are. So what's my objective? It's to accept the reality, whether we like it or not, that drugs are here to stay to accept that reality and to learn how to live with that reality so that drugs do the least possible harm and in some cases the greatest possible benefit. More specifically, I would define my objectives with respect to drugs and drug policy in two ways. The first is I want to reduce as much as possible the negative consequences of drug use. I want to reduce addiction. 
I want to reduce disease. I want to reduce HIV, AIDS, and Hep C. I want to reduce the criminality associated with drug addiction. I want to reduce the suffering that people, individuals, and families, and communities go through. Whatever possible to reduce that suffering, that harms of drugs, because all drugs can either be used safely or dangerously to reduce that harm. But that's not my only objective. There's a second objective. I also want to reduce as much as possible the negative consequences of our failed prohibitionist policies, of our failed war on drugs. I'm concerned with addiction and people dying, getting hurt by drugs. I'm also concerned when we live in a country, a country of freedom, which now leads the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens, which leads the world in the number of people locked up behind bars more than China or Russia. I'm concerned when we're arresting 1.6 million people a year. I'm concerned when we increase tenfold the number of people behind bars on a drug charge from 50,000 in 1980 to half a million today. I'm concerned when people are struggling with addiction and they're treated like criminals, especially if they're poor. I'm concerned when we're taking laws that are steeped in racism, as so many of our drug, drug laws are, and we target the enforcement of these laws disproportionately in people of color, black and brown people, rather than other people. When they're targeted young rather than old. When they're targeted at people who can least afford to be targeted. I am not here to argue that every drug should be legalized and sold like alcohol or cigarettes. Uh, you know, not only is that a politically a, a nowhere argument, but I don't think it's the best policy. But I am here to say that we have to reduce the harms of drugs and the harms of our failed drug policies, that it is very much like what we saw with alcohol prohibition 70, 80 years ago. You know, this country passed a national amendment. We don't do that very often to prohibit alcohol around the country. And people hoped it would eliminate alcohol from the face of our society. And it looked like it might work for a few years, but then it backfired. People started drinking more and more. They didn't drink beer, they drank hard liquor because you wanted more bang for that buck. And then you had Al Capone and organized crime and violence and corruption. Tens if not hundreds of thousands of people being killed and blinded and poisoned by bad bootleg liquor, liquor that was more dangerous because it was illegal. Young people looking up to bootleggers as role models, jails, prisons, courthouses, overflowing. And there was an answer back then, which was to repeal that alcohol prohibition law. John D. Rockefeller, wealthiest man in America, said it quite well. He supported the prohibition movement. He said, I'm a teetotal, and I've been a teetotal, and I hate alcohol, and I will never use alcohol. But I have now come to the conclusion that the solution I advocated in the form of prohibition is doing more harm than good. And we have to end the days of prohibition and move into a world of sensible, pragmatic policies to regulate alcohol and its harms. That's what we need to be doing today. Thank you. Now here are some opening statements from Asa Hutchison, not to exceed four minutes. Uh, Mr. Hutchison, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back at the University of Arkansas. Actually, I don't live very far from here, so I'm here frequently. I'm an alumnus of the University of Arkansas, and I congratulate uh, the uh, university programs and all of the students that are here that have created this public policy debate that is actually an important one for our future and certainly for the next generation. I want to welcome uh, Ethan. Uh, we have debated uh, on occasions before, usually on CNN, uh, but uh, I want to welcome you to the University of Arkansas, and I want to explain to you later how Arkansas is going to beat Alabama on Saturday. In the meantime, in the meantime we do need to uh, talk about this particular issue, and the way Ethan started out, you know, there are a few things that we agree upon. He said that drugs are here to study. You know, there is without any question, and I've always said that every generation will face a battle with some form of illegal drugs. You know, whether it's methamphetamine, whether it is cocaine, or whether it's marijuana, or whether it is some other, maybe it's Oxycontin, a prescription drug that they get off the market, there is those temptations out there. Drugs will be here, and we have to determine as a society how we're going to deal with it. Now he also says, which was a little bit confusing to me, that uh, he did not want to legalize drugs, but then he wants to come back and say he wants to end prohibition. Well, uh, I don't know how you can do both of those. You either are going to say cocaine, marijuana, heroin, methamphetamine are illegal, 
or you're going to say they are legal substances and we're going to regulate them in some fashion. Now, I believe that the terms of debate tonight should be in terms of our fight against illegal drugs, what will be the future? Are we going to decriminalize, are we going to legalize uh, methamphetamine, heroin, uh, cocaine, and yes, marijuana is a part of the debate. My background comes from a whole host of perspectives. I've seen the tragedy that drug addiction does to families. I dare say that every family represented in this room has seen it, whether at a distance or close up. We know the challenge of drug abuse. The question as a society, how we can reduce that. And I believe that when you're on the right path and you have made progress on a social problem, don't wave the white flag of surrender. And for example, if you look, in 1979 was the year of the highest drug use in our country. And since 1979, because of the efforts of education, because of the efforts of rehabilitation and enforcement combined, <laughs> overall drug use has been reduced by, would you say 10% is a good margin? Would you say 20% is a good margin? How about one third? one-third reduction in illegal drug use since 1979. There is an annual survey called Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services at SAMHSA, and there's others monitoring the future, but they have consistently shown a decline since the 70s of illegal drug use. In fact, cocaine use has gone down even more dramatically. It also showed another statistic, and that is that in 2011, the United States spent $10.4 billion on drug education and treatment, compared to over $9 billion, excuse me, yeah, $9 billion on domestic law enforcement. So $10 billion on rehabilitation education, less than that $9 billion on domestic law enforcement. And whenever I started back 20 years ago, let me tell you, it was out of perspective. There was more spent on law enforcement and less uh, in terms of rehabilitation. But because of drug court initiatives, because of, of changes in alternatives and incarceration and improvement in rehabilitation, that balance has come back better. And so we've made progress. And I'm here to tell you, and I agree with Ethan, there are some things we can do better in our country. He asked about discriminatory policies. Well, I haven't just complained about it in the last 10 years. Since I was in Congress, we actually did something about it. I advocated it in Congress, and we have accomplished it this year, which is reduction of the disparity in crack and powder cone cocaine in sentencing that had such a disparate impact on African Americans in that community. And so, yes, we can change things. We reduce the mandatory minimum penalties. I have joined the right on crime. What is that, fifth thing? Time's up. We'll, I, will, I will talk about some of the other areas of progress that we've made in fight against drugs and improving it. So don't wave the white flag of surrender. Let's improve the system where it's broken and make it work for the next generation. We're going to move on to some prepared questions. Uh, we'll have each speaker speak for two minutes, and then they'll each be able to re uh, be able to have a rebuttal, one minute each. Uh, Mr. Hutchison, you'll be able to answer first. This summer, a global commission of former world leaders and activists put out a report calling for the U.S. to drastically shift its drug policy away from incarceration, citing that the current system of locking up users and abusers isn't curbing drug abuse and is ultimately not an effective measure to take against the problems associated with drugs in society. Do you think this commission is right in their conclusions, or are they misled and don't fully understand the effectiveness of the war on drugs in the United States? Two minutes. Well, the uh, Global Commission report, which I have read, is a report uh, that basically adopts the European model of harm reduction. And it advocates that for everywhere. Uh, did it properly evaluate what's happened in the United States? No, I do not think so. Uh, for example, it, they, the uh, report talked about an increase of global drug consumption. In fact, cocaine, according to the report, had increased globally by 27%. Well, during that same time period, cocaine use in the United States declined. 
dramatically decline. And whenever you look at uh, other drug use, uh, they've all uh, declined except for marijuana use in the last two years. All of them have, have declined since the 70s and even uh, uh, declined even the last couple of years except for marijuana use. So I don't think it fairly treats what's happened in the United States. Secondly, and this is really part of your question, is our incarceration rates. Well, the fact is, if you look at our federal prisons, less than 2%, I think that's 190. Less than 2% of all federal prisoners in the United States are in custody for simple possession. And usually that's because they started with a trafficking case and they pled it out so they could, and they accepted the simple possession. But less than 2% are incarcerated for simple possession. The idea that the federal government in the United States is incarcerating simple users is a myth that has been perpetuated by those who simply want to legalize drugs. And the fact is, we don't. And so, yes, I think the commission report does not recognize some of the things that happen in the United States. For example, the uh, commission report does not talk about drug treatment courts. How many of you are familiar with drug treatment courts? Drug treatment courts are alternatives for someone who has an addiction problem so they don't go to jail but they go to a treatment facility with accountability, and it's been a very successful program. And so many states, including Arkansas, including myself as a person, has advocated for expansion of drug treatment courts. That's not addressed in it. The crack powder cocaine reform legislation was not addressed. So the progress uh, was not addressed in it, and I think it is misleading. Okay, well, uh, I was actually honored to be able to serve as an advisor to that global commission. And this wasn't just any global commission. This included three of the most distinguished former presidents, not leftist presidents, but center-right presidents from Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia. It included Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations. It included Paul Volcker, the former Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. It included George Soltz, the former Republican Secretary of uh, Everything. Right? It included uh, Richard Rand, I mean, many, many distinguished people. And I'll tell you this. Um, what they basically said, and this goes to Ace's point about, well, is it either legalized or war on drugs, and there's not all that much in between, except maybe drug courts. What I would say is what the commission said, and what I would also agree with is, when it comes to drug policy, as with most other areas of public policy, you're talking about policies arrayed along a spectrum. From the most punitive, lock them up, cut up their heads, drug test everybody policies of Singapore or Malaysia, or maybe parts of the United States, to, on the other hand, the most libertarian free market policies, like, say, the way cigarettes were treated uh, 40 years ago in America. And that there's a whole series of steps along this way. Now, what I'm advocating for, Asa, is to let's move things down this direction. Let's reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control policy to the maximum extent consistent with public safety and health. We don't need to be putting the... the we don't need to be putting a, the criminal justice system and the cops and the prosecutors front and center. We don't need a drug czar who has to be either a, a former police chief or military general or professional moralist. How about somebody from a public health or a medical background? When it comes to marijuana, when it comes to marijuana, yes, let's make it legal, let's tax, control, and regulate it the way we do, say, with hard liquor. Are there risks associated with that in terms of more people using marijuana? Yes, of course. But when you look at the FBI statistics that came out a couple days ago saying that half of all the drug arrests in America are for marijuana, almost entirely in possession, when you look at the crime and violence in Mexico, when you look at the violation of people's civil liberties and rights and all this, I think there are risks you got to take to move in the right way. policies in the European uh, nations. And uh, you pointed out Singapore. I think that's one of the problems of taking a global report with Singapore that has a uh, let's cane them uh, type philosophy. Uh, sure, they need to adjust in other uh, parts of the country. Perhaps they should not execute them like they do maybe in China or some particular countries. Obviously, we don't do that in the United States. So comparing what we do with what uh, the Global Commission is recommending is not necessarily the right thing. 
I'm glad Ethan laid it on the line and he simply said, I am for the legalization of marijuana. But he also acknowledged that that would increase uh, usage uh, in the United States, or at least there's a risk of it, I think is the exact language that you use. Uh, but he, he throws out this, this scary prospect that we have law enforcement officers out there arresting people for simple possession. Well, it is a true statement that we do arrest for that, but that's where the, they do not go to prison, they do not go to jail. Quiet, please. Quiet, guys, during the debate. Thank you. Yes, let me ask you a question here. How many of you in here came in here tonight supporting the legalization of marijuana? I just wanted to, how many of you came in here opposed the legalization of marijuana? As I said once, I'm glad our DEA agents did not lose faith in me as they came here. No, we have some friends here. But clearly, you see the burden of proof that uh, is before us today. Yeah. I, I think, Asa, one of the problems with your statistics, when you talk about the 2% behind bars for drug possession, is that you're sp talking specifically about people sent to state prison where drug possession federal, is their principal federal, charge. Federal, federal, federal and state federal, prison. Federal, federal, but federal, federal 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 only. Federal only. Federal only. Well, federal only. Federal only. But look, there are 2.3 million people behind bars in America today. Less than 10% of them are in federal prisons. And in the federal prisons, over half are there for a drug law violation. It used to be 60%. And many of them are simply drug couriers or poor people from Colombia, Mexico, Africa, whatever, who get thrown away for 10, 15 years. When you look at the 750,000 Americans in local jails, a lot of them are people like people in this audience and their friends who are getting thrown away in jails for marijuana charges. And when you look at the 5 million Americans under the supervision of the parole and probation system, they're getting picked up for maybe a joint or a dirty urine, and they're landing up oftentimes in state prison. It's just not being called the drug charge. It's being called whatever they got arrested for in the first place. But I think, you know, the, the bigger thing, and I think this really highlights, highlights our difference, you pointed to 1979 as the worst of all years, right? Why? Because you said more Americans admitted to using illegal drugs that year than ever before, and you're right about that. And you're saying that come the 1990s or today, it was down by, uh, by 30%, therefore we're having great success. And I would say to you, 1979 was probably the best of all years. Not because it was good that so many Americans were using illegal drugs, but most of those who were, we're yuppie snorting a little cocaine and uh, high school seniors and college kids smoked a little weed, the vast majority of whom did not have a problem. 10, 15 years later, drug use in America had fallen by 30 or 40 percent. But you want to know something? In 1979, nobody had ever heard of crack cocaine. By 1989, it was a national epidemic. 1979, nobody heard of drug led HIV or AIDS. But now we have a quarter million of people who've been infected or died because we haven't had the right policies. 1979, we were spending two, three billion dollars a year in the drug war. Now we're throwing 50 to 100 billion dollars a year down the drain. 1979, 50,000 people behind bars on a drug charge. This year, half a million. They're both going a little over time, that's okay. Mr. Nadelman, I'll let you answer this first. Many argue that legalizing marijuana would simply lead to more children being able to more easily obtain the substance, which is definitely not the opposite of the situation we want for the youth of America. Do you think legalization will just lead to more use by children, thus taking away the credibility from the advocates of legalization? Basically, no. I think the risk of increased marijuana use is more going to be among people my age and Ace's age because we're the ones who no longer have such good access to it. Uh, but when you see that there are now three national surveys in which they ask high school juniors or seniors which is easier to obtain, which is easier to purchase, marijuana or alcohol, and young people say it's easier to buy marijuana than it is to buy alcohol. You know what else? Every year they ask, you know, marijuana use among high school seniors and juniors has gone up and down over the last 30, 40 years. But there's another question. They say, is marijuana easy to obtain? And consistently, even as use has gone up and down, 80% of high school seniors say it's easy to get it. So quite frankly, almost anybody in American high school, young people can obtain this, can obtain it today. I don't think that's the risk. 
I think the risk is going to be among older people beginning to use marijuana, and there I think it's a matter of trade-offs. I think for some people, using marijuana they have is going to be a problem. It's, marijuana is a drug. It can be addictive. It can be a problem. On the other hand, there's growing evidence out of the medical marijuana world that many people find marijuana more effective than pharmaceuticals. And that for many people, and that for many people, marijuana is preferable and less dangerous and less harmful than alcohol. Because let's be clear, you know, there's never been a marijuana overdose fatality. Yeah, you, should not, you should not drive under the influence of marijuana, but all the evidence shows that driving under the influence of alcohol is dramatically more dangerous. You know, as Gary Johnson, who's now running for uh, president of the public primary, said the other day, he goes, I remember when I was in college, you know, there was alcohol around, people were getting rambunctious, violent, sexual problems, you know, getting out of the wheel of cars. You had a joint going around a party? Hell, give the guy a pair of headphones and a bag, a pack of Fritos, and he was set. So, quite frankly, I think we've got to look at the relative risk in our society. Well, the question asked was if you legalize, are you going to increase? Uh, the consumption and access to marijuana by the youth. And I agree that access is not the issue. Uh, the youth of our country, uh, whether it's another, marijuana or some other uh, illegal substance, uh, they probably can have access to it. But I, and so you've got usage now if somebody was bent on doing that or you've got access to it. I think the challenge though, if you legalize, is that it sends the message that obviously this is a safe substance, uh, it is something that is okay, that authorities have said, uh, or policymakers have said it is lawful, it is okay to use. And so that message is what will trigger an increase in marijuana use. Now, if everybody in this audience believes that marijuana is a healthy substance, then there's really no sense talking about it. But if we would agree that marijuana is a harmful substance, then it is a serious consequence to say we're going to take a step as a nation to that's going to lead to increase access and drug usage. Now, let's look at history. Let's look at Alaska. Alaska decided in the 70s that they were going to <coughs> legalize uh, marijuana or decriminalize marijuana. And so they did that, and usage among teenagers increased significantly enough that the parents were so concerned that in 1990, they recriminalized it. And so that's a lesson from history, that <coughs> parents saw a problem and said, we've got to correct that, all of the, the uh, society did at that time. And so, yes, you're going to increase usage if you believe it is a harmful substance, I don't think that's the way for America to go. Well, how much time? Yeah, uh, thank you. Sir. You know, in the 1970s, 11 states decriminalized marijuana, and an academic named Eric Single analyzed, did it have any impact on marijuana use? And what he found was, no. He found that, in fact, marijuana use went up generally across America in the 1970s, both in the states that decriminalized and those that did not. And he found that marijuana use went down across America in the 1980s, both in those states that decriminalized and did not. Same evidence comes from abroad. There's a wonderful book called Drug War Heresies by two uh, experts who are not advocates, uh, Peter Reuter and Rob McCoon. And what they looked at, when you look at Europe, what you find is that levels of marijuana use have nothing to do with the harshness of the laws. You have countries with harsh laws and high levels, countries with harsh laws and low levels, countries with soft laws and high levels, and vice versa. There's not that much of a relationship there. What the laws do is result in more people getting hurt by the government. They don't affect the levels of marijuana use. What impacts the level of marijuana use in America is really the action to a large extent by our leaders. Mr. Nagelman has really uh, uh, laughingly, jokingly treated the subject of cocaine use 
and marijuana use. And whenever our teenagers today see marijuana as medical marijuana being authorized, then they think marijuana is medicine, it's okay, it's okay for me to take it. And so that's the reason in the last couple of years of my judgment that you've seen a uptick in marijuana use while other uh, drugs have not gone up. And it's leadership, it is what the signals that our leaders send in society. And whether we, if we joke about it, uh, it can go up, teenagers get that message. If we treat it seriously and say this is illegal, yes, that has an impact on decreasing usage in our country. And I think that's a good thing. And as one argument against legalization is simply the message that it sends to our young people, not that we're gonna lock you up forever, not that you, you're gonna destroy your life, but it is illegal, it is wrong, and it is harmful. And the law reinforces the harmfulness of that substance. Mr. Hutchinson, we'll go with you uh, next on this one. In 2012, Washington State, Colorado, and possibly California will be voting to decide whether to keep cannabis illegal or become the first states to legalize, tax, and regulate the substance. If they are to succeed, how do you think other states, as well as the federal government, should react? Well, first of all, it's going to be a nightmare in enforcement if that happens. You would have uh, the states in direct conflict with federal law, Federal law, uh, the policymakers, Congress has uh, still made it illegal to possess, to use, and traffic in these substances. If you have a state, California, Colorado, that says it's legal under state law, uh, that is totally in conflict. Uh, just because somebody says, well, I've got this marijuana under state law, well, it's still a violation of federal law. So how does the federal government respond to that? They can ignore it, is one option. They can change their own policy to go along with California, a very major state. They could third seek an injunction in court to prohibit the, uh, uh, the use in accordance with the state law because it violates federal law. Or the other option that they could take would be to say, all right, that's your decision, but we're going to withdraw our federal funds for drug rehabilitation for drug enforcement, our DEA agents are going to come out of the state. Uh, so if you think that's a good thing, then that could be a consequence of that. I got a feeling the people of California will not want the federal resources that protect against uh, methamphetamine trafficking, against heroin trafficking, against cocaine trafficking, against other types of uh, trafficking, uh, to uh, those resources to be withdrawn and potentially. Uh, other resources in it. So there's a number of different reactions. Obviously, it's going to depend upon uh, who's in, uh, uh, you know, what our policymakers in Washington will say as to the direction we go. I think it would be a dangerous step uh, for our country, but that's the great thing about democracy. That the people do get to decide this issue. And let me tell you, if, if, if you win in the public arena, hats off to you for that victory. But thus far, I don't know of very many members of Congress, I don't know of very many elected officials who want to move in that direction. But it's a democracy and the people will decide. So, uh, Asa and I can agree that it's going, it is and it's going to be a confusing situation. And I should also say that I and my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, we've been deeply involved and played a pivotal role in roughly two-thirds, basically legalizing medical marijuana, roughly two-thirds of the states where it's now legal, and we're deeply involved in California and Washington and Colorado as well, trying to draft and put forward and win responsible legislation. Now, I think first, there are two precedents, there are two models in this area. One of them, more recently, is medical marijuana. And I think it's important for those of you in Arkansas to know, there's a good chance you're gonna have an opportunity to vote on a medical marijuana ballot initiative in November of 2012. And it's important for you also to know that if it wins, it's not going to set up a situation like Los Angeles or Montana where things got wildly out of control because local legislators failed to regulate it. The laws here are based upon the models in Arizona and Maine, much more strictly regulated, limited number of medical conditions, doctor's recommendation, limited number of dispensaries. So Arkansas can really emerge as a model of the responsible regulation of medical marijuana in the United States. So I, I hope you get on the ballot. I hope it wins. Now that said, there's also a bigger historical model. 
You know, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, as public opposition to alcohol prohibition rose, many people said, let's end federal prohibition. But as we know, members of Congress are often the last to leave. Leadership has to come from the people, and then it comes from the states, and eventually Congress follows. Well, what happened in the late 20s and early 30s was one state after another began to repeal their alcohol prohibition laws. The feds could still bust people, they didn't have the resources, and they increasingly lacked the motivation. And eventually Congress got the message and they repealed federal alcohol prohibition. That's the model for reform with medical marijuana and also with marijuana more broadly. The states have to take the leadership, they have to roll it back, they have to push the issue on the feds and Congress. And by the way, a month or two ago, Ron Paul and Barney Frank, you know, the libertarian Republican, the left-wing Democrat, co-introduced a bill to repeal federal marijuana prohibition. And to my amazement, it already has about a dozen co-sponsors, Democrats, Republicans, including Dana Warbacher, you know, conservative of Southern California. So that political play, that messiness that Asa talks about is right, but there's no other alternative. We're going to lead this thing from the ground up. unintended consequences to uh, a ballot initiative that will purport to legalize whether it's the medical marijuana or uh, the uh, marijuana that's on the uh, ballot now, full legalization of mar marijuana. Reverend Scott Immler, who is the co-author of Proposition 215, that's a proposition in California, the ballot initiative that legalized medical marijuana. After it turned into a where you have cannabis uh, medicinal shops on every corner of the city of Los Angeles and in uh, San Diego and elsewhere. Uh, this is what he said. We created Prop 215 so patients would not have to deal with black market profiteers. But today it is all about the money. Most of the dispensaries operated in California are a little more than dope dealers with storefronts. That was the result of the initiative that was passed in California. He also said it turned it into a joke. I think a lot of people have medicalized their recreational use. Now, I don't mean to diminish that. I think that if there's a medical need and uh, the doctors say you need a particular uh, substance, whether it is uh, Marinol or marijuana or whatever, if the doctor, medical community says that, then patients ought to be able to get that. But there is wrath, it is, it is wrath with uh, abusive potential, and California is the model of abuse and problems with that initiative. You know, I'll tell you, um, that story about dispensaries generating all that crime, and I saw you quoted it in some CNBC piece a while ago, quoting the uh, California Police Chiefs Association, which is known for producing evidence-free reports. Um, <laughs> today, today, the RAND Corporation, the Rand Corporation, consultant to the Pentagon, intelligence agent, came out with a report, and they said, lo and behold, and somewhat to their surprise, when you have a medical marijuana dispensary, you see a reduction in neighboring crime. That's the Rand Corporation's result today, and it's consistent. It's consistent with the findings of police chiefs and other in Colorado and other places. When you responsibly regulate this stuff, the result is to take this stuff out of the underground, out of the black market, and put it into the responsible channels. Did they indicate whether usage increased? You well, said but actually, you know, it's very interesting as you mentioned that issue, because in fact, for many years and still today, there's almost no evidence that legalization of medical marijuana results in an increase in marijuana use. What did the study say about increased usage? Causes. The ranch thing was about the dispensaries issue. Uh, yeah, we, do you want to start an interruption thing going? Um, I'm from New York. We're good at that. Um, we're we're going to hold it back. Um, but what I just want to say about this is that when you substitute responsible regulation for a failed prohibitionist policy, that can lead to the best of all results. You know, that's what we're looking for here. I think one of the tragedies with the Clinton and Bush administrations and now with the Obama administration, Obama appeared to open up some room for doing this the right way. And in recent months, what is the Justice Department doing? What they should be doing is encouraging states and localities to responsibly regulate the medical marijuana dispensaries. And instead, what are they doing? They're getting in the way. They're trying to keep this thing messy. They're trying to keep it underground, trying to delegitimize it rather than being advocates for the responsible regulation. 
that really does need to change. Ethan, we'll let you answer this one first. <clears throat> this past summer, a prison reform bill was signed into law in Arkansas, which not only increased the cutoff for a felony marijuana possession charge by one ounce to four ounces, but it also lowered the penalties for many illegal substances in the state. This was in response to a Pew study which discussed prison overcrowding and the cost of incarceration. It was approved by the Arkansas House and Senate and championed by Governor Beebe. What is your take on this bill, and do you think Governor Beebe is taking a step in the right direction? Yes, he is. And Governor Beebe and the state legislature moved in the right direction. Arkansas, the legislature passed, and the governor signed intelligent le legislation that was based upon good, hard evidence about public safety, reducing prison population, saving taxpayer dollars. My guess is that this is an area probably where Ace and I probably agree more than we disagree. I mean, one thing I'll say for Asa is that among Republicans and conservatives, he was among the first to point out the injustice of the federal crack cocaine laws and to advocate for changing those laws. And there was a powerful coalition that resulted in reform in that area. I want to say that when Asa mentioned the organization, right, on crime that he's a part of, it's really two sorts of people. Some of them are Republicans and conservatives who basically just want to reduce the criminalization of white collar crime. But there's a broader group that really cares about reducing incarceration and incarceration of poor people and rolling back on these harsh drug sentences. What we're seeing around the country, from Democratic governors like you know Cuomo and, and Brown to Republican governors like Mitch Daniels in Indiana or Governor Deal in, in, uh, in Alabama or Governor Christie in, in New Jersey, everybody's struck by both the injustice and the ridiculous expense of locking up more and more Americans. That's why we're seeing that last year was the first time in the last 30, I think, that we saw a reduction in the total state prison population. We're headed in the right direction. Now, the fact of the matter is it's budgetary pressures putting that way. We're not seeing incre increases in crime as a result. The question is, is can we sustain that once the economy turns around? Can we understand, I mean, look, our country, People say we're the biggest drug users in the world. We're also the biggest consumers of almost everything in the world. Because we're one of the biggest and richest countries. But our rates of drug use, illegal drug use, are not that different. They're a little higher than many other countries in Europe and elsewhere. We're not radically off the charts. And when it comes to nonviolent crime, we're also not so different than many European countries. Right? We're higher on gun crimes and some things like that. But you know what? We lock up people, mostly our fellow citizens, and five and six and seven times the rate of most other civilized nations who are pursuing a policy of incarceration, a policy of mass incarceration that is not required to sustain public safety. And if anything, when you send people to prison, what are you doing? You're turning them into better criminals when, you, when they come out. You're exposing them to more criminality and you're providing them. You're making it that much less likely that they will ever have the opportunity to obtain a legal job and legal work and become a tax-paying family person. It's hard to make uh, generalities. Uh, you know, you could almost uh, listen to Ethan. He thinks nobody ought to go to prison. I happen to think that violent criminals uh, belong in prison, people who are a danger to society. I happen to believe that Bernie Madoff deserves going to prison. Me too. And uh, Me too. it was even a violent crime. And, and I think that uh, whenever you have a drug trafficker that is bringing in uh, tons of, of cocaine or marijuana that's poisoning our youth, I think they ought to go to jail. But having said that, I agree totally that uh, Arkansas was right in, in saying we want to make sure we're studying and ass assessing and determining whether we're sending the right ones to prison or not. And certainly someone who's a simple possession case uh, or has an addiction problem, they're nonviolent. Let's look at an alternative to incarceration. Absolutely. <laughs> And whenever you look at uh, the, the Right on Crime initiative that I have supported, and it, it's, it's conservatives that, uh, from Bill Bennett to Newt Gingrich to myself, they say it's right for us to, and, I, and, and I'm former head of the DEA, uh, but uh, Texas, for example, took that initiative and said instead of spending billions on new prison facilities, we're going to put that money in 
alternatives to incarceration and rehabilitation efforts and after uh, uh, programs that will help reduce crime in Texas. It did reduce crime. It saved the taxpayers money and it was the right thing to do. So that's the direction we can go as a country. And so we're really in agreement on that. If there's unfairness in the system, let's fix it. But while we're fixing the system, let's don't demolish uh, what we're doing right in it and send and go down a path that we will regret for a long time. Uh, whenever you look at the direction that we're going as a country, uh, I think that uh, we did in the past uh, make some unfair judgment when it comes to drugs. For example, for a while, Congress said if you had a drug conviction, you could not get a Pell Grant and go to school on, a, on an education loan. That was wrong. We singled that out and it was wrong and we remedied that. Uh, I have a particular case in which a person was convicted 30 years ago of marijuana and he's denied entry into our country. I think that's wrong and I think Congress needs to remedy that. And so there's always injustices that we need to fix, but let's don't change the right direction that we're going that will destroy a generation. I mean, I think, I mean, so you, I think he appreciates that I'm an enthusiastic <laughs> advocate of putting murderers and vicious criminals and the madoffs of the world behind bars. I think that's where they deserve. I wasn't sure. And I think there's a lot of nonviolent criminals doing a lot of extortion and theft and hurting a lot of people. You know, I believe in the, the basic biblical notions of punishing those people who, who murder and rape and steal and what have you. But I can't find that prohibition on marijuana in the Bible. Uh, I can't find it in the Hammurabi Code, for that matter, and I can't find some of these other things either. So I'll tell you, here's my basic view about how we deal with drugs. I think there's a principle that applies across the board to all drugs. I would say, and I do believe, and I hope many of you agree, that nobody should go to prison. Nobody should lose their freedom simply for what you put into your body if you don't want to go out. what you call that drug, but nobody goes to prison simply for what you put in here. Get behind the wheel of a car, put your co-workers in danger in the workplace, beat up your, 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 your children, do other sorts of predatory crimes. Yes, you deserve to be punished, and don't come to your addiction to some sort of excuse. But when it comes, when it comes to how we regulate this stuff, because I am not comfortable saying treat methamphetamine and cocaine like alcohol or cigarettes, what I would say there is marijuana, yes, tax control and regulate it like alcohol, but for those people who are most addicted, for those people who want to stop and cannot, for those people who are determined to get their drugs, whether they're legal or illegal, I would say allow them to get it from legally licensed, medically administered sources. We've seen in Europe and Canada now seven or eight countries that allow heroin addicts to come to a clinic and get the pharmaceutical heroin there, and the results published in all the top medical and scientific journals have been spectacular in terms of reduction of disease and crime and those problems. That's the way we move in the right direction. and you're nonviolent, if you're a simple user, I would agree you should not go to prison. We are in agreement on that point. There's not any issue here on that point. But, it, but I do believe that marijuana is a harmful substance, and I think that you understand that marijuana is a harmful substance. If you, okay, some of you don't agree with that. But if, we can't even, we, 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 uh, we're not going to go anywhere in our discussion if you don't accept that proposition. But if you believe that it is a harmful substance, as the American Medical Association believes, then it becomes a longer debate as to uh, if it's harmful, we, should we keep it illegal? And if we keep it illegal, you've got to be able to have uh, investigations and you've got to have laws against the traffickers of a substance that is illegal we've determined is wrong for America. And so, yes, I think the DEA does the right thing in going after a drug trafficking organization from California that's bringing methamphetamine here. 
I think they're doing the right thing by putting somebody in jail who's selling uh, marijuana close to a schoolyard. I think they're doing the right thing by putting people in jail who's trafficking in cocaine. These are harmful substances, and we and you might not punish the user. We might not put them in prison. We might put them in a rehab program, but I think the trafficker we still have to have incarceration for. Mr. Hutchinson, you can start answering our last question, uh, prepared question. In 2001, Portugal decided to combat its drug problem in a quite unique and unconventional way through decriminalizing all drugs. In 2009, a report from the Cato Institute came out calling this experiment a success. What are your thoughts on decriminalization of substances to help lower addiction and drug abuse rates? Well, first of all, uh, there's, there's something you can always learn from another country's uh, testing and adopting a different policy. And Portugal <laughs> had a problem with uh, drug abuse and, uh, and also the allocation of their own enforcement resources. So they said, instead of putting our enforcement resources against uh, the simple users, we're going to put it against a trafficking organization and we're going to put it in rehab programs. And the result of that has been that their arrests for trafficking organizations went up. Uh, it, it, the number of people in rehab went up, which is a good thing. Uh, and I think you can probably debate about the impact on usage. The Cato Institute that did this study, you've got to understand the Cato Institute. What a great organization, but they're libertarians. They, one of their big uh, points of advocacy is let's legalize drugs. So, you know, that's a little bit of a point of view that they bring to the table. But if you take a little bit more independent review, the European Monitoring uh, uh, Group for the European Union looked at Portugal, and whenever they decriminalized in 2001, drug use was at 7.8%. It went up to 12% after their decriminalization effort in 2007. That's a significant increase in drug use. Uh, whenever you look at marijuana, it went from 7.6% to 11% in Portugal. And so I don't criticize another nation. They've got their unique problems. But the point I think you can learn is that marijuana use went up uh, in Portugal when they decriminalized because it was a simple signal that the leaders said to their youth of the nation and maybe to the older citizens as well that marijuana use is okay there's not going to be any consequences. We're not even going to consider it illegal. So it's okay. Drug usage goes up. And I don't think that's the right direction for America. Well, Ace is right. Cato Institute, good studies. They are a libertarian organization. So therefore, look at the article by Alex Stevens and Caitlin Hughes in the British Journal of Criminology at the end of 2010. Two academics looking intensively at the Portugal story. And what they found was that Portugal was a resounding success. The drug use levels did not change all that much. Some a little up here, some a little down there. And then when you compare the use levels in Portugal to other countries in Southern Europe, they basically track some of those levels as well among overall use. But you know what went down? The problems of addiction went down. Drug related arrests and crime went down. Eight new HIV and new Hep C cases went down. Overdose fatalities went down. And there was all the things that really mattered, the harms of drug use, where we went down. And you know what that Portugal thing is? It's essentially like a, almost like a drug court outside the criminal justice system. If you get arrested and you're in possession of some drug, any drug, in a small, non-large amount, you get sent to meet with a commission of health experts. And they talk to you about what's going on, and do you have a problem, and, and are you addicted, or is this not really such a problem, then you really should do it, get out of here. And for them, they focus on the most serious cases, which is when drug addiction and mental illness intersect, where nobody's got a good answer in that area. But they treat it as a health issue. And you know what else? They don't drug test. They don't drug test. They rely on counseling. They deal, they deal with drug use for the entire population the way America deals with drug use among the upper middle class. <laughs>
The upper middle class in America, by and large, is not going to jail or prison because they deal with their drug problems and drug use behind closed doors where typically the police are not present. And they can pay for the psychologists and therapists and dry out programs and what have you. It's the poor people who are getting screwed, who are told being told, go to jail for it. And, and the Portuguese say, the Portuguese say, same model applies to everybody. So, what a signal is that sent? You know, I think there's a fairly good debate. In fact, uh, we debated this while I was at the DEA in Detroit. You've got a, a, a poor, uh, economically depressed area where you've got your crack houses. Well, you've got your whites from the suburban area driving across town to the crack houses and buying their drugs and going back. Now, is it right for the DEA just to prosecute the crack dealers? Or should they go after that white guy coming from the suburbs? Who's a user? Now under the arguments here, you leave the, uh, in a Portugal argument, you leave the, the white guy in the suburban area alone and you go after the crack house. Well, I'm not sure that's good policy. I think a better policy is put your resources on rehab, make sure you work in your drug courts and you have treatment programs available, you make sure your education, but send the signal that it's illegal to transport drugs, to deal in drugs, and it's illegal to buy drugs. Otherwise, you've got a conflict. Asa, Asa, the question comes down to how many hundreds of billions of dollars and how many millions of wasted lives do you want to spend in order to send a certain message? I mean, the Portuguese and people like them and governments like them are sending a message that we're focused on the bottom line. We want to reduce death and disease and crime. Drug use may go up or down, but we want to reduce death, disease, and crime, and we want to save the taxpayers' money. That's what they want to do. They're not legalizing all drugs, but they're not doing a war on drugs either. If they're seizing a lot of drugs at the border, it's because they're part of the European Union. Most of the drugs coming to Portugal are going elsewhere in Europe, and they have obligations to the rest of their neighbors. It has nothing to do with the message that you're talking about. But when you talk about message, 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 I mean, come on already. 750,000 people busted for pot to send a message. Millions of young Americans given criminal records to send a message. 40, 50 billion dollars a year being spent on the war on drugs to send a message. People's lives being destroyed to send a message. Stop with the message already. We're doing all kinds of things. How about, how about the message being, we don't want you getting hurt by drugs or by the government. Uh, we'll now hear closing arguments from Mr. Hutchison in a speech not to exceed four minutes. I think Stephen's got some water for you. Uh, Mr. Hutchison, the floor is yours for four minutes. Well, again, uh, I, I applaud all of you for your interest. This is an incredible crowd for a very interesting uh, public policy debate. Uh, thank you, Ethan, for your uh, New York in your face approach, but also, <laughs> you're very welcome. I, I say that with uh, deep affection, and uh, uh, really thank you for coming here and participating in this debate. We disagree, but there's some things that we agree upon as well. And I think one thing that we've established in this debate tonight that uh, we both agree that if you're uh, guilty of simple possession, that you have an addiction problem, you ought to get treatment, you shouldn't go to jail. I think we both agree that we need to, to continue to evaluate who we're sending to jail, make sure we're going after the traffickers and not simply those that are, have an addiction problem. But where we fundamentally disagree is in one concept, and that is he, uh, totally disparages the role of law enforcement in uh, our uh, enforcement of marijuana laws and our enforcement of all drug laws. Uh, he disparages the message that we need to have in our society that this substance is harmful, therefore it is illegal. He says it is, maybe I don't know if he says it's harmful or not, but he says it ought to be legalized. And that's where we have the fundamental point of disagreement. Now. Uh, he says we don't want to, uh, he's tired of hearing messages. Well, he just gave a message. And the message he wants to send to America is, 
we're going to have a bifurcated message in America. If you're a user, okay. Don't worry about it. It's never going to be in your record. It's not illegal. It is, it is fine. Everything's okay. But if you're selling to that user, it's illegal. I think that's a silly approach. And I think it's totally the wrong message. And the message that he will send to, to the next generation is, go ahead, increase use of a harmful drug. Now, the other aspect is law enforcement. It's sort of interesting to me that I think law enforcement is an important part of the package. Uh, whenever I uh, went into private practice, I practiced law, and I went into an exercise facility. I became a member of that. And as I went up to the uh, owner, he said, Asa, good to see you in here. By the way, you sent me to prison. And I was about ready to turn tail and head out of there. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I want to thank you for saving my life. Uh, you sent me to prison. And he was, he was not just simply a user. He was a little bit more than that. But it took a law enforcement to make him confront reality that he had a, a, a drug problem. But if you go to a drug treatment court that we all support, in a drug treatment court, and I've been in those graduation ceremonies, that they've been through a year of rehabilitation. They've got over that. They're restored to their family. They've got over their addiction. They've got their job back. And they take that diploma and they graduate after that year of hard work, and the first person they thank is their arresting officer. Because that arresting officer enforced the law and said, you've got a problem. And it made them face that problem. If you're not a Hollywood star, who goes to rehabilitation voluntarily? It's, it, 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 it would take an arrest, generally, a trigger in your life, or an intervention, which is usually the arresting officer. So law enforcement does play a role. The American Medical Association has never indicated that marijuana has a medicinal benefit and they point out that smoking marijuana has more carcinogens than smoking cigarettes. I'm amazed at going to California. Look, take your beef to the American Medical Association. Don't take your beef to me. Uh, if you go to California, you can almost be arrested for smoking a cigar out there because they have such strict rules in California against smoking cigarettes. But they're happy, almost. They're very tolerant of smoking marijuana. And I think that's quite a little bit of an inconsistency. It points up the harm, the health harms that the medical community still believes in marijuana. It is a harmful substance, and I think we should continue that it is an illegal substance. Thank you very much. And Asa, thank you for engaging in this debate. It's rare that uh, heads of federal law enforcement agencies or even former heads are willing to do so, and I appreciate that. Uh, I will tell you, I'd be happy to come back to Arkansas and have the same debate in front of an audience of the Arkansas political establishment or law enforcement establishment, so that we can get a little And uh, uh, I also want to reassure you that I will root for Arkansas against Alabama this week. Sure. Oh. So, uh, but let me say this. Um, you know, on this medical marijuana issue, you just gotta stop with it already. Because if you go to the National Institute of Health and plug in the words medical cannabis, the stuff that will come streaming out will blow your mind. The results that are coming in on the therapeutic value of cannabis are astronomical. The stuff about the cigarettes versus, I mean, marijuana does not compare to cigarettes in terms of addictiveness. The average marijuana smoker does not consume anything close to what the average tobacco consumer consumes. And beyond that, with vaporizers emerging, many of those harms are being reduced dramatically anyway. So, you got to stop. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't make any sense. But I, look, I, let me close this off, not by focusing on, on, on Ace's thing right here, but because so many of you are sympathetic to the arguments that I'm making in this debate, what I want to stress is that what we're doing here is we are trying to build a political movement, a movement for change in this country. Right? And, you know, Drug Policy Alliance, the organization I've been building, that's my life. It's about trying to turn this into a powerful organization and lead a powerful movement. Now, you know, some people will ask, well, you know, who are these guys? You know, I mean, I know what they're about. They're just the people who like to, you know, kick back and smoke a joint. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what I say to them? You know what I say to them? There's a little truth to that. Because many of us are people who have smoked 
smoked marijuana and derived positive benefit or, or done some of the hallucinogens or psychedelics and had profoundly positive experiences in our lives. You know, we are people who are basically, for whom drugs has not been a harmful thing, it's actually been a positive thing, and we can't stand the fact that we're being treated as criminals by our government and by our values of freedom. But you know who else we are? You know who else is part of this key movement? We're also the people who hate drugs. We're the people who have seen the worst that drugs can do. We're the people who have lost our children to overdoses and cleaned up the puke of our alcohol parents. We're the ones living with a sibling with HIV and somebody else with hep C. We know how drugs, bad drugs can be. We're the ones who have seen the gateway theory hit our families, and we're the ones who wish that we could live in a drug-free society. But you know what? We know that that is not attainable. And we know that deciding to criminalize us because of our addictions and criminalize our families is not the right way to go. We know that the war on drugs is not the way to deal with the reality of addiction in our society. And you know who else we are? We're also the people who don't give a damn about drugs. We don't see ourselves as drug users, although maybe we uh, have that coffee in the morning and that wine in the evening, and maybe our kids on Ritalin and our wife's on Prozac. <laughs> Drug use. But you know what we do care about? We care about basic freedom in this country. We care about the government not tossing 150 to 100 million dollars a year down the drain. We care about government being fiscally responsible with our taxpayer dollars. Because we are libertarians who believe in the role of the market. And because we are civil libertarians who believe in freedom. Because we are people who can't stand the racial injustice of the war on drugs and who recoil at living in a country that leads the world in incarceration. We're the people who don't give a damn about drugs, but care about responsible public policy. So who is, who is this growing movement? We're the people who love drugs, we're the people who hate drugs, and we're the people who don't give a damn about drugs. But every one of us believe that the war on drugs is not the way to deal with this reality in our society. Yeah.